Welcome to We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only show dedicated to the process and strategies for transforming apartment buildings to thriving communities. I am your host, John Brackett, and welcome to the show. All right, folks, this is John Brackett, the host of We Build Great Apartment Communities. I have another amazing guest on today. His name is Mauricio Ramos. You know, international traveler, international business person, and investor. Very excited to have him here. And he has some really cool experiences. His background is in civil engineering. You know, he has some experiences as a limited partner, also as a general partner, building. And so this is going to be a great show, a lot of value that's going to get created, and more importantly, added to our audience. So Mauricio, welcome to the show, man. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Really excited about this. I hope everybody gets the popcorn out and uh, said, because it's going to be a good show. Oh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Hey, so let me, let me introduce our audience okay, to you. Let me, let, me, let me share with them your background a little bit so they have an idea of who you are, where you've come from, and why the beautiful industry of multifamily investing, okay, multifamily real estate. So, uh, I'm going to start by just giving them your background. So, um, you know, you're, a, you're an accredited investor, right? You founded Medici Group, which is based out of San Antonio, Texas. You currently own and manage about 60, 65 units, and you're a limited partner in over 400 units, which I think is great. And so you also, you also um, Mauricio, have an engineering degree. And if I'm not mistaken, it's in civil engineering, correct? That's correct. Yes, sir. Okay, so you're a civil engineer, a civil engineer. Now- um, I, I, I find that a, a very interesting combination. I think it's a great combination, right? Because inside of the world of real estate, we're always dealing with structural requirements, right? At some point in time, there's some structural things that come up, et cetera. But, you know, with your academic background and some of your experiences in different areas of real estate, why multifamily? Why multifamily? Why was that an attractive space for you to, uh, to migrate into? That is, that's a great question, John. So when I, when I started looking into, into real estate, I, of course, um, it was single family, right. And I, and I started dabbling a little bit with, um, some trying to wholesale a few properties. And when I would get into, you know, I would find a lead and wanted to get a, uh, you know, be able to get him an offer. I would have to, to basically reach out to somebody else and say, Hey, can you, can you help me run comps? Right. And I never, I was never r- real good at running the comps. I was, I was explained how to do it a few times and I was like, oh, it's, I felt it was very subjective. Right. So Interesting. when I finally found multifamily and learn how to analyze it and how to run numbers on multifamilies, like very numbers oriented, right? Like hard numbers. This right. is the income. These are the expenses. And yes, the, sub, the, the cap rate can be a little subjective, but it's very hard numbers, right? And as an engineer, numbers make sense, right? Numbers course, don't, don't lie. That's so, how your brain works. Yeah, exactly. So that's how, that's how I got in love or fell in love uh, with multifamily is, hey, this is it. Like numbers, I can control it. I, I mean, I, I see how it is. I, I was able to almost like educate a little bit the sellers like, Hey, you know, this is kind of how it's really valued. Yeah. You probably paid this much for it, but uh, you probably overpaid and explained with numbers. Right. And not just how I feel or just because the property next year sold last year for that much. That doesn't mean that your house, you know, uh, it's worth that that much. Right. 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 That's, that's that number side of multifamily is what really uh, caught me. Hey, so you said something there that stood out to me. So you said you were presenting to sellers. So are you an agent or a broker? Are you are you selling? No, no just uh, pure, purely investor. So oh, some, as a wholesaler, as a wholesaler. As a wholesaler. Got, right. it. As, got it. Got when it. We were, when we were looking for properties and we, we do a lot of off market. So and and all the properties that we bought have been off market, right? So sure. every time we've had to sit with a seller and say, "Hey, th- this is our offer, and this is why," right? And it depends on each each one, but it got into a point where we have to explain why we're offering that in to a detailed level, right? And then you can always uh, rely on your numbers. Hey, I, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate the explanation. So for you, it, it came down to really math, right? 
it was more, the math was more predictable. Determining value was more predictable because the, the, the math, uh, it sounds like, you know, the way that your brain works, right? You're very, you're very numbers oriented. So for you, it created some predictability, not only in value, but in also managing to, in this case, uh, net operating income, right? That's exactly right. Okay, beautiful. So, you know, I hear a lot of buzz now about San Antonio, right? And you're mm-hmm. in there. By the way, the Riverwalk, man, I love that. The Riverwalk's one of my favorite projects of it's all times. Yeah. Beautiful. Took my wife there. This was, um, this was a couple of years ago, but never forgot that. In fact, I was shocked when I went in and you see this beautiful, amazing area, right? Really? In San Antonio. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's truly. A great it's town. Truly, I love it. It's truly amazing. It's really amazing. And now a lot of cities are copying that whole theme, which I find uh, really fascinating, right? So that's, what, what is it about San Antonio, man, that's creating all the rave right now? I know a lot of people are migrating there in terms of jobs, population, right? But also investors. Um, there's more demand, it seems like right now, for multifamily product. What's going on in San Antonio, man? Share the love. Share the yeah, love. Ab- ab- absolutely, man. Absolutely. So it is, it is a great town, good location. It's kind of closing off to the, to the border where there's a lot of international uh, trading. Ah. Is, is, it, it, there's a lot of job growth, a lot of companies moving into San Antonio as, as is a little cheaper to be here than maybe compared to Dallas or Austin or Houston. So, and then, and then when, when you look at it, it's not necessarily a primary market, right? It's, it's, you know, there's Dallas, there's Austin, a little bit of Houston where prices, like if you look at price per unit, at least pre COVID, you know, they were trading at 90 plus per unit. Right. right? And here in San Antonio, it was, it was still more affordable where you could find a property, maybe at 65, 75 a door, you know, again, pre COVID with all this COVID, it's all fuzzy, but uh, it, you, it was, more affordable in in it was just a little further out from the the all the new york people and the california guys that wanted to come in and park all that reap money yes, into course. like dallas right and, sure. and austin again and grand cardone coming to buy half of austin right so you didn't have to compete with all those guys right so san antonio is one of those cities that that makes sense there are a few other kind of like secondary markets in, in, in Texas, but San Antonio is definitely a strong one. Uh, great location. You, you know, you have, you have a variety of, of income generating um, items here in San Antonio. Kind of like you said, tourism, right. And then, and there's Amazon and uh, there's, there's other, there's Toyota, uh, which has a large company. There's USAA, sure, sure. which has the headquarters and there's other kind of like nationwide companies uh, with great establishments here in town who are big employers. You know, I, I didn't really, um, you said something earlier, man, that I, I really liked and I've heard the term used before, but it was a term that described all the border cities. What was that? The Riviera? What did you call it? Rio Grande Valley. The Rio Grande Valley, man, I've heard that many times and I never really understood what that meant until you've explained it. So can you elaborate on that? Because it speaks to the job migration that you're talking about, right? Companies moving um, closer to the border, but yet I know Texas is a big area for migration because very business friendly state, but you get the benefit of cross-border trade, right, by being right on the border there. But talk a little bit about the Rio Grande Valley, man, because I think that's a very um, – it, 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 it's, a, it's a telling opportunity for migration, right? It so is. can it, you speak it, to that a little bit? Of course, I'd love to. So just, and just to also make a difference between the two, so San Antonio, it's four hours into the, into the border, but depending on uh, – at least from the Rio Grande Valley um, – in the Rio Grande Valley, which goes from Brownsville, which is pretty much on the coast, uh, goes west along the border all the way to like Rio Grande City and uh, Roma, Texas. Right. Maybe, maybe might include Zapata and some other towns, uh, which is, I don't know, probably like a two hour drive from one point to the other. So all that, all that area along the border, we call it, we call it Rio Grande City. One of the main towns there is McAllen, which is across Reynosa. 
And I personally grew up in Matamoros, which is across Brownsville, Texas, where the where the Tesla, uh, uh, the, uh, where the uh, SpaceX uh, is one, one of the SpaceX uh, sure. locations is. So uh, we own property in McAllen in in entirely the, the the Rio Grande Valley it's just a great location it, it's it's it, there's a lot of international trading you know it's a big it, there's a lot of um manufacturing companies on both sides uh, on the Mexico side who manufacture um you know multiple items that they export come into the US and then you know there's multiple businesses that either assemble it in the United States in in the Rio Grande Valley or put it in a truck and take it to cities like San Antonio or Houston or even further north north to a bigger manufacturing company and put the the final product together. Sure, sure. Right? And, and they comply. So there's with. a lot of value being created along the way, right? Exactly. Um, it, very interesting. Very very interesting. I, I I find that fascinating, and now I really understand actually what that means. But it also makes sense from an economic standpoint, right? And I never really understood the language or the, um, the regions within that language. And now I do, man, thanks to you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot a little bit. I know you're an expert in San Antonio. You also have holdings in McAllen. But yes. let's talk a little bit about, you know, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, the markets that you are excited about, right? So inside of San Antonio, there's some sub-markets that I know are, are creating some noise now. What submarkets do you like in San Antonio and, and why? You mean like areas in San Antonio? Yes, yes. That you, that, that yeah. you, when I say what submarkets or areas in San Antonio, areas that you, that you think are great opportunities for, you know, multifamily investing, right? Of course. So, so the, the south side of San Antonio is pretty strong. You have a, you have a, you know, heavy, might be heavy Hispanic on the south side. But man, I mean, some of the some of the best properties that I know um, from my you know fellow owners here, other IROs, which we call IROs, um, independent independent rental owners. So other IROs that own smaller properties, right? On in South Texas, I mean, is is probably where you have the strongest rents down there and strongest occupancy. Also. Uh, west over hills, which is in the west side of San Antonio, it's being it, 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 there's heavy commercial development in that area, from you know infrastructure infrastructure being built by the city, uh, by the government, in in large commercial developments to multifamily, and of course the north side. Um, the north side is a very very good area, uh, all the way from Stone Oak all to which is kind of like 281, which, you know, there's a big loop in, there's two loops in San Antonio, 410, and then 1604, which is the outer loop. So right. on the outer loop, I would say probably from 12 o'clock to maybe 10 o'clock, uh, it's, it's definitely a very, very strong um, area in town. So, so I'm, I'm always excited about those areas. Yeah. It sounds that way, man. It sounds like you spent a lot of time researching those areas, right? So, you know, we're in, we're in this COVID market right now and mm-hmm. it's changing the way business has been done and will change the way business will be done for probably, you know, in the indefinite future. Right. But yeah. what are some of the positive things that you've seen have come out of this pandemic as it relates to how you approach your business when investing in multifamily real estate? And that's a great question. I think we're still kind of transitioning as we go. And, and uh, you know, what we thought in May might be a little different uh, now or was a little different in July and it's a little different now in August. It, it's it's kind of like uh, evolving all the time. But uh, we're we're sometimes I'm a little concerned about, you know, seeing all those for lease signed when it comes to retail. But... Uh, specifically in our properties, there's been a little bit of turnover, but we haven't seen an issue with uh, uh, vacancy. Uh, Not really an issue. People are still kind of being able to figure out a way to continue having their income. You know, there's, there's been some changes. We know there's some people, some of our residents have told us, Hey, you know, I, I got laid off. And then, you know, within a couple of weeks, say, Hey, I got a new job. Just, just give me a couple more weeks and I'll catch up. And, and we've seen, we've seen, um, 
basically steadiness on our on our tenant base. Uh, but definitely, there's been some change. So it's there are some some businesses that are just thriving, right? A lot of people doing maybe Uber Eats or items things like that. Right. And there are some other stores that you go and they're pretty slow and it's kind of concerning, but maybe they have a lot of like to go right or delivery. So I think there's some industries that just the way they work, they're, they're just going to be affected and, and it's going to have to, it's going to change somehow. We don't know how, but there are others that have been able to figure it out as they go and have been able to stay afloat, um, which is pretty interesting to see. You know, it's really interesting what you said. I, I'm going to, I'm going to compare that to, I have a, uh, one of my neighbors, right? One of my, my mm-hmm. neighboring tenants, he owns a sushi restaurant that's been around for quite some time. And, um, he, guy, guy cracks me up man. and his, he and his partner, they're both Japanese. Let's see. Second generation. I think, I think second generation, but you know, when we first got into this pandemic and you know, we talk all the time, um, and the guy's just funny as heck, man, but he said something that, that was really true. Right. Uh, and this came from his partner who's, who's a little bit older than he is. Uh, but you know, he said, and he, I'm not going to imitate his voice, man, cause I'm, I'm not going to be able to do it, but it's awesome. He said, you know, John in, in war, in war, we have winners and we have losers, right? You're going to have those that are going to win and those that are going to lose. And he's referring to businesses, but the way that he looked at it was he compared it to a war, right? And it sounds like because of uh, how he was brought up, right, in, in the strong Japanese culture. So his comment was, hey, inside of every single environment where we have catastrophe, we're going to have, we're going to have, and if we looked at it as a war, we're going to have winners and we're going to have losers. But what I took out of that conversation was for him, it was, it was an expectation, right? Not everybody is going to make this. Not everyone is going to, from a business standpoint, not everyone's going to survive this the way that they're operating today. That doesn't mean that they're going to come back and, and develop and evolve into something even more amazing, which is usually the case. But not yeah. every business is going to continue to uh, survive based on how they're currently operating, right? Usually mm-hmm. they're going to have to evolve. But I found that, 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 that um, comment, man, so so true. And I never really looked at it like that, but... Because he said it that way, it was like for him, he was very calm, right? Because inside his mind, he just knew that he had to be one of those companies that that has that has to evolve, evolve. right? And they have. And now what they're doing, instead of them catering to the retail masses, you know, they've created a membership club and they're catering only to high net worth individuals on a, um, I think they're scheduling. They've been around for a while, so they have a really good network of people. Uh, okay. but it's a club very exclusive now and that's how they're operating man. And they're doing really well. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. That's it's so interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so with that said, using that analogy, how are you evolving your companies to be able to capture opportunity in this market? That's, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I'd say, you know, we're, we're, our properties, we, what we, you know, because rental is everywhere, right? There's, there's if right. people looking for a place to live. They can go, they can go to every corner pretty much and there they'll find something. But what we do, we try to give our properties a touch where, mm-hmm. where they look different from the other properties, right? We implement a lot of art artwork in our properties, um, which is uh, kind of relates to the history of the Medici, which is the the, the name of my company um, that they they implemented and sponsor a lot of artwork uh, in their time. So we like you know giving it a touch to not just painting it and in, in, in installing nice light fixtures, but also giving it that extra touch where people want to live there, and where we've created. To this point, we have a waiting list on on some of our properties of people that want to live there. Right. They're willing to pay a little extra. Yes, the property next door is the same size, the same layout, and and it's probably fifty or maybe seventy five dollars cheaper, but they want to live in ours. So you create you create distinction inside of your assets, right? So if I'm understanding you correctly, just to walk our audience through this. Mm-hmm. So you're finding ways to differentiate yourself from your competitors by incorporating artwork. And it sounds like also 
just creating design themes that make you stand out, right? Yes, that's okay, correct. Okay, very interesting. So why do you think people are willing to pay more for artwork and design, all things being equal, right? There has to be maybe yeah. a couple other components to that. Yeah, so of course, you know, the, the, the management and, and the basically uh, customer service, but a, a, lot of the, a lot of the millennials and younger crowd, um, you know, they, they've been – They've been to, you know, they've been to Austin, they've been to New York, they've been to San Diego, and they've seen, oh, man, look, look this, this mural is super nice. And they come back home in McAllen or San Antonio, and it's like, ah, we don't see a lot of, there's a little bit of that in San Antonio, a little bit of that in San Antonio, but not much. And they go back home, and they all of a sudden find this apartment complex that has a mural right? A big mural or has implemented some artwork on, in their hallways is like, oh, you remember when we went to, you know, San Diego or New York and we saw this is so cool. Right. I want to live here, right? So, so it's something that might be more popular in, in bigger cities. So we bring some of that here locally, bring a, we bring a local artist and and we're able to, you know, give it that touch. Got it. And it, Got it's it. mostly, mostly, I'd say, heavier on the younger crowd. But I mean, we have we have all all ages uh, in our resident base. Okay, Ben, that makes a lot of sense, and I think that's really smart, right? So, if I heard you correctly, what you're saying is, hey, John, what we've learned is because people are a lot more traveled now, right? We have more people that are traveling. We've learned that if we incorporate some of the culture into this uh, with art, okay, we're mm -hmm. able to differentiate ourselves a little better, but we do that by hiring local artists, okay, to create a theme that's going to appeal more to our target audience, which it sounds like you guys are really designing your apartment communities to be able to attract uh, millennials. So it for you, okay, cool. So for you, it's, it's very... Um, tenant specific. I mean, you, you know where you, who you want to target and why. And so you design your communities to really appeal to that tenant profile. That's correct. Right? Yeah. It, very, it, very, very smart. And they, and you know, t the typical, the typical younger, uh, professional, you know, that's making good money, um, or even a younger couple that both are making good money, you know, they're willing to pay that, that, that extra to live in an, you know, nicer or better looking place. Okay. Okay. That makes, a, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, one of the things that I love about what we do here, okay. In, inside of the show is we share our successes around some of our most profitable apartment communities. Okay. Because mm -hmm. it gives everybody an understanding of why this industry can be so amazing and why and how you can profit inside of investing in this product product type, right? Or this asset class. So considering some of the concepts that you just shared and how you guys differentiate yourself, your apartment communities, your product, uh, share with us your, your most successful investment. Okay. And kind of talk us through that. And why was it so successful? So I'd say, um, Sonterra McCall apartments, this is a 32 unit apartment complex in McAllen. Um, we bought it for less than 40 a door. 32 units mm -hmm. and um, it was a, is a good condition built in, in the, in the nineties, 95, I think uh, we put in about $128,000 and this was borrowed, borrowed rehab money uh, from agency, uh, Fannie Mae loan. Um, and we've remodeled at this point, we've remodeled all the units um, brought and this is one of the properties where we brought an artist uh did some nice paintings and murals on the exterior um and then did a series of of remodel on the outside uh, better lighting Th this property has three neighbor and three neighbors basically there's four properties pretty much alike mm -hmm. next to each other and Hours, I mean, stand out. We've gotten calls from people that just driving down the road is like, man, I saw your property from the road. Looks awesome. Especially after we, we, we brought the local artists and say, say, Hey, just from the road, you can definitely catch your eye. Um, so the rents were originally 550 average when we bought the property. Um, 
average right now, we're like at 675. Oh, there's, really there's out of the 32, there's eight we're units or six units actually that have, we were able to give them like a little extra patio. So those units are renting for like 750 a month. Mm-hmm. Um, and our neighbors are still renting for 575, 600 max. So that, that's, a, that's a great example, right? That's a great example. Yeah. So for $3,000 per unit, what, 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 what kind of improvements are you, are you um, implementing? Yeah, uh, so new flooring, uh, LVT flooring, a new color scheme, new light fixtures, um, being in the valley, uh, in the Rio Grande Valley, we found a, an affordable enough granite supplier and installer that we were able to install granite countertops. Um, this, this specific location had uh, a kind of like an island style um, range hood instead of it being up against the wall. Right. This is like in the middle of the ceiling. Right. So we replaced this. Uh, they were like kind of like a millwork 90s build um, range hood out of wood. So we replaced this with stainless steel and like glass curved top um, range hoods. And it's just as soon as it's pretty much the first thing that you see when you walk in the door and it's every time it's like, Oh wow. They just that range hood. And then having those granite countertops. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, light fixtures, uh, an accent wall. We have an accent wall. And then the exterior has um, wood accents, so we we installed some of that some of that wood on the from the numbers to the main sign of the building um, to the little. We changed all the um, the balconies to the nicer wood balcony. So, so Marissa, here's a question: When, when you're hiring mm-hmm. this artist, right? This this designer. Mm-hmm. Are you spending what percentage of your improvements are going to the exterior versus the interior of the property? I know it's going to vary by asset, but roughly speaking, what 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 does that look? What has that kind of shaped out to be over the years for you? About twenty five percent goes to the exterior and seventy five into the interior. And then wow, you right? were roughly able to so. recapture that value with that ratio, roughly, right? Absolutely, it's it's this simple. I mean, we're we're uh, we're getting under contract an eighty eight unit uh, property also in McCallie right now uh, next to the airport. Very very good location, and you know, you walk in, it, it's very forgotten about this property. And then and then as from the is you have to think about the experience of the prospective resident from the minute they pull in the property. Right, in this property in specific, this this thirty two unit. I mean, this eighty eight unit. It doesn't have a. The leasing office is further in. It's not by the street on the, like on the typical uh, you know apartment complex. This right. is further in, so you have to drive in. I don't know, like two hundred feet. So, so we have to change that experience from this from the curb. That's smart. All the exterior. So all that exterior has to be improved. Right. So from the minute, from the second they drive in the property, they're like, oh, wow, I want to live right. here. Right? Right. right. And by the time they get to the unit, they're sold. Yeah, right. Man, that is, that is so smart, man. Especially what you said about the customer experience. Right. That's something that we really focus on in our communities. And very rarely do I hear people say that. But I, I think the way that you describe that made a lot of sense. Right. You're focusing on the customer experience. Exactly. Especially when you have a long driveway because. Mm-hmm. You know, in 200 yards, a lot goes through your mind and you can make a oh, lot man. of decisions yeah. in 200 yards, right? Especially, especially when it comes to renting space, space that mm-hmm. you're living in. So what, what do you think was the biggest improvement that you made within that 200 yards to drastically change the experience of your mm-hmm. prospective tenant? Yeah, and this is this is one property that we'll be acquiring. But part of the plan is, you know, put signs from the street, say, pointing towards the leasing office. Then uh, there's some parking, covered parking on the property, but specifically in front of the uh, um, leasing office, there's not cover, no, not cover parking. So we want to do a little bit of cover cover parking for future residents, right? So you you know you feel nice when you pull in. All right, sure. I'm in a cover parking. Sure. And then uh, there's, there's, we found that there's a long enough wall that you have to walk by 
Uh, it's probably eight feet tall and it's probably 30 feet long. And you just have to walk by to get to the door of the leasing office. So we're going to do a mural on this wall. So as you are walking towards the, you, you're by, you, by, just by looking at the mural, you're like, oh, wow, look at this mural, right? It's right. awesome. And, right. and then by that time, you know, you're probably 50% sold when you walk into the leasing office. And then a little bit of the customer service sh- should be good. And then finally, you get into, into the unit where, that we're going to show you. And then that's it. You're sold. Man, so how important do you think are those little psychographics, right? So everything that you describe, right, very strategic, to building up the experience. Plus, it doesn't sound like it, it's, it requires a lot of investment mm-hmm. to help shift the psychology of your tenant to be ready to buy once they sit down and, and speak with your leasing agent, right? How important do you think that is? Very, very important. It's really important. I mean, it, it's, it's, um, if you, I've had it, I've had it where, and, and probably one of my first properties, I started remodeling the inside of the units. And then I got to the exterior a little later and I saw that push from the residents saying like, hey, you know what? I like the, ex- the interior of the unit, but I'm a little concerned about the, out- the outside. Is it safe? You know, is, is, I, I'm not sure, you know, maybe, maybe if it's a single woman, I don't right. know if I want to live here, but, but if you immediately change the outside, you know, looks safer, bright light, LED, uh, bright at night, you know, you have that parking, it's clean. Sure. There's no broken windows. Those items is it, 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 from the outside. It's the first is like that uh, blink book by uh, Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know if you read it. Uh, he talks about the first, the impression that, that a person forms in, in, in their head. Uh, when you look at something, the first two seconds, the first two seconds of, of what you think that's going to be kind of like the strongest idea that you're going to have. And it's very, it's going to be very hard for you to change the impression that you got in those two seconds. Right. And that's, that's what you have two seconds, right? It's a great book. And, if, and what if, is, what is the book called just for the audience? Blink. Oh, like blank. blink of an eye. Blink. Oh, blink, 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 blink. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And uh, it, it's, it's a great book. So this, this is kind of what I'm talking about. Like the right. first two seconds you have to do, as soon as they pull in, they have to do a great impression. And same with, um, even if you want to take it to the digital concept, right? Uh, if they Google the property, right? The first pictures that come up, if, if those are the old pictures when, when before you bought the property and they, it doesn't look like that, man, you better change them. Man, so, so really what, what you're talking about is becoming a marketing master of your, of your asset, <laughs> right? I mean, it, really, it is, yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, I mean, you have to learn how to market your, your property, how to market your asset. So you talked about, okay, the design theme, exterior, interior, creating the experience, right? So that by the yeah. time your customer is sitting down and meeting with your leasing agent, uh, that customer um, is pretty much already sold on the community at that point. It's really mm-hmm. up to the leasing agent to further the benefits. And then of course, you know, get the prospect committed. Right. But now uh, you also touch on something else though, is on the marketing side, every, everybody, one of the first things they're going to do now as a tenant is they're going to Google the community, right. To look at the reviews, That's to exactly learn right. more about the neighborhood. Okay. And so you're right by that, that now is a Google and that search engine is a point of sale. Okay, that's mm-hmm. a sale opportunity for the community, right? Without yes. having a salesperson there, it's still a sales opportunity. Yes. So it sounds like you guys spend a lot of time dialing that in. It, we, I mean, we have it just from experience, right? We've, we've some, at the beginning, we wouldn't pay, pay my, much attention to, you know, the Google search. Right. And it will, it will push on the property. And then we would realize, you know, people would, would start asking questions. Hey, does the property look the way it is on kind of the Google pictures? Or, or they would show up and say, oh, wow, it doesn't look like this in Google. And so we started wondering how many people that we lose just by the pictures on Google, right? So right. now um, we took over those, those Google APIs and we've been able to change those and update as, as we go, right? And immediately as, as soon as we finish that artwork, we put it in. We put it in there and, and then that definitely helps. Very smart, man. Very smart. Well, man, we are at the end of the show and I wanted to personally thank you 
uh, Mauricio, for being a guest. You've shared some amazing insights. And I think the, the, the perspective is very unique, right? Because it's coming from the viewpoint of an engineer who's also a marketer and who also likes talking about the customer experience and design. So you're left brain, right brain, man. That's kind of unusual. Uh, but I, I can see how that, that's played into making your communities uh, very successful, right? And so I think that's kind of a unique um, talent that you have, right? To be able to use uh, both sides of your brain, man, to, to yeah. community. So I want to thank you for being a tremendous guest. Uh, Mauricio, how do our, our, our audience, how do they get a hold of you if they want to reach out to you? Of course, I'll be happy to share it and just want to say, uh, John, thank you very much for this opportunity. I definitely enjoyed it and uh, definitely good, good, good talk. Uh, so uh, they can reach out to uh, via email office at the Medici group, the Medici, it's uh, D-E-M-E-D-I-C-I group.com, like the Italian last name, uh, our webpage, group. Dot com. You can schedule in my webpage, you can schedule a 15 minute call with me and I'll be happy to talk anything about real estate. Also uh, via Instagram, Demerici underscore group and on Facebook, Demerici group. Awesome. Awesome. Really appreciate you sharing. And then finally, last question is uh, what questions do you have of me, uh, Mauricio, that you feel may be able to add some value to our listeners, if, if anything at all? Um, what would you say, uh, how can, uh, what's a good way of a Texas investor and owner to bring uh, California money? Doing exactly what you're doing now, man. Let it, telling, you people about, <laughs> telling people about what you do. That's exactly awesome. it. Yeah. People have awesome. to know about who you are, what you do. And I think, uh, being on, on mediums like this is great because it is, it, it, it exposes you to people in different parts of the country, right? Of course. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is, um, you know, people who want to invest, uh, it's not always the opportunity that they look for. In fact, usually it's, it's the opportunity is, is, is secondary or third to the person, right? Because yeah. people want to connect with people, which is why, at this point in our business, I mean, I'm, I am so focused, man, on living a rich life. I've learned that, you know, if I can focus on living a rich life, okay, I naturally attract people that, that, are, that are like that. And life is fun, right? Uh, I think at this point, uh, building wealth is the byproduct of just doing the right things and meeting the right people and then also um, just sharing different experiences, right? So uh, what you're doing, man, just keep doing what you're doing. I think you built an amazing, um, it's really a, kind of a really unique way to approach product. But I think the reason why it's really cool is, you know, in class A product, that's very common, right? I mean, the experience mm -hmm. starts with just the design. Right. right. And then they move to the amenities and then, right, the, it, it's all throughout the entire community. But you know, oftentimes in these secondary markets, as you say, that's the opportunity, right? Is how do you take a luxury product concept and scale that down and still provide the same level of service, if not higher, with, you can't load that, you can't load a, a C, you know, a C-class product up with all the amenities because economically it won't make sense. Right. But you can still provide a higher level of service or the same type of service with, with, with a more unique design theme. And man, I think that's what you're doing. And 100%. Really that's good what model. we're trying. Yeah. yeah. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Awesome, man. I love it. That would be my feedback. Keep crushing it. And, um, you know, I will reach out to you uh, and look forward to you us connecting next time on, a, on another uh, conversation. For sure. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Anytime, man. Thank you. Clarity of Purpose creates our greatest competitive advantage. When we transform apartment buildings to thriving communities, we improve how people live and create assets with high profit margins. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this up with a friend. I'm John Brackett, bringing you things you can implement right away.